nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Good afternoon, morning or evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new workshop in our series on data science and machine learning in engineering and uh, science applications. Uh, today, I'm uh, very excited to introduce Vinay Hetke. He's a postdoctoral fellow at Citrin Informatics, uh, where he works on uh, collaborations with in, uh, industry, national labs, and universities in, in the general area of materials informatics. Before joining Citrin, Vinay was uh, a PhD student. He got a PhD degree uh, from Northwestern University, where he worked on uh, machine learning in the context of material science. And he was one of the co-developers and, and uh, folks maintaining the Open Quantum Materials Database, OQMD, which is one of the most popular and uh, largest database, databases of uh, calculated materials properties. Um, it's uh, our pleasure to uh, welcome Pinay to, to our uh, series. And uh, the fact that he comes from a company, Citrin, uh, goes to show that uh, these type of tools are not just of academic interest, but uh, there's a uh, significant uh, interest in the uh, corporate side. Uh, so with that, Vinay, the, we're all yours. Thank you very much for that introduction and welcome everyone. Thanks for participating. Um, so we have uh, a lot of content to cover, so let's uh, step right into it. Um, and before we jump into the notebook itself, spend the first few minutes going over the outline of what we are going to do and go over some of the high level concepts. Uh, so let me walk you through that. And the goal of this workshop is to give you kind of an interactive hands-on introduction to deep learning um, and to delve a little bit into detail, I hope this workshop gives you kind of a, an intuitive, very high level overview of some of the concepts like convolutional nets, autoencoders. Um, and I also hope it kind of demystifies this uh, deep learning and um, hopefully working with these Python libraries like Keras, which we are going to use, um, will show you how these mature packages have really made it drastically easy to to work with neural nets and, and apply deep learning. Um, and finally, I hope this motivates uh, you to think how you can apply deep learning methods in, in your own materials related work or research. Uh, even though we use examples with a um, you know, small molecules data set, I hope the, uh, the principles and methods we use are generally transferable for, uh, for your work as well. A couple of caveats for using small data sets, so the models we build will not be very good. And uh, you know, due to time constraints, we won't have uh, any sort of rigor in the in the definition. So most of uh, the discussion around concepts will be uh, quite casual, so to speak. Uh, but in the notebooks and in the slides, which are available on NanoHub, you'll find a lot of resources and links for you to follow and you know go back and take a look to understand what's happening under the hood. So with that, uh, just to you know bring everyone on the same page. Uh, when people say deep learning, they are usually using that as an umbrella term to refer to um, methods involving neural nets and some representation learning. Uh, and a very quick summary of how a neural net works, just to, again, bring everyone on the same page. Uh, it is at the root of a neural network is what is known as a, an artificial neuron, which basically takes some input performs some operation on it um, and gives out an output. And these individual neurons are then connected in different architectures. Uh, for example, this is a traditional feed-forward neural network where these, you know, these neurons are arranged in layers where each layer passes on its output to the layer following it, which receives it as an input, performs these operations, and uh, sends out an output to the next layer and so on. So when people refer to deep neural nets, they just mean that 
the number of layers that you see here, the hidden layers, are uh, usually uh, more than a few. And um, you know, deep learning has taken off in the past few years, mostly because of uh, the amount of data, the cheap computational power, and uh, and some algorithmic advances as well. Uh, but one of the things I, I just wanted to mention uh, when compared to traditional machine learning approaches, um, one of the advantages that deep learning has is uh, there's a step in, in traditional machine learning where you need to do a lot of feature engineering, which means you have to uh, work on how uh, how to the you know uh, how to engineer the inputs that go into a, a neural uh, machine learning model, whereas it, in deep learning the neural net kind of learns these representations by itself. So that's kind of an advantage. We'll we'll go over an example of what this means later. And uh, as far as what you can do with deep learning, this uh, this list this list actually goes on and on. Uh, but I listed here the three things that we will be covering in in the hands-on workshop today, which is you know we'll use it to model property, uh, we'll use it to learn some data representations, and we'll also use it to generate some novel materials. And uh, again, so this uh, kind of overall picture will hopefully help us orient ourselves when we are deep inside the notebook. Uh, so I have a couple of slides on what we'll actually be building today. Uh, it, it's in two parts. The first part is we'll be building a convolutional neural net for predicting solubility of molecules. So we'll be working with a, a data set of molecules for which there, there have been um, measured water solubility data. And then we are going to featureize those molecules, build a convolutional neural net to predict the solubility, and then use this model to, uh, to query new molecules and predict solubility for them. So for example, this you can imagine these kinds of um, models will be super useful in, uh, in industries such as pharmaceutical industries where you know, a new molecule is discovered and an important property might be how water soluble that is, right? So it's, it's an important uh, industrial problem. Okay, well, this, this is very generally applicable to other properties as well. And I just want to make a, sh a quick note on, on this featureizing molecules aspect of it. Uh, th by featureizing molecules or representing materials in general, uh, what I mean is conveying to the machine learning model or a computer uh, information about the material itself. So you can think of that as, you know, uh, as simple as just fractions of elements that go into the material or uh, features that involve some crystal structure information. There are various uh, different ones I've listed here. So there's soap, there's uh, crystal graphs, et cetera, which we won't be using. What we'll be using today is uh, known as smiles, which is mostly for small organic molecules. Uh, and the panel on the right here shows you kind of an example. So this is a, uh, an organic molecule here. And uh, following an algorithm, the smiles string that you see in the bottom right is a, is a representation of the molecule itself. And, and we'll be using this kind of a smile string as a representation of, a, of the material uh, throughout today's workshop. We'll in fact modify this uh, smile string slightly uh, to uh, to generate what are called one-hot encodings, but we'll go on to that a little later. And the second part of what we'll build today is we'll be building a variation auto encoder that basically uses these smile strings um, and kind of encodes it into a latent uh, representation, which we are then going to sample to generate entirely new smile strings or entirely new molecules. Right. So the fact that we are using previously known smile strings to generate these entirely new smile strings means that we'll be generating some reasonable molecules and uh, realistic molecules. So um, before we again jump into the note notebook, I want to take a few minutes just to go over at a very high level some of the concepts um, or behind, behind some of the techniques we're going to use. So in the first part, I said we'll be uh, constructing a convolutional neural net to predict solubility. Right. So convolutional neural nets are basically is any neural net that has at least one layer which performs what is known as a convolution operation. And convolution is basically a way of transforming your input data uh, in a specific way using something called a filter or a kernel that you see here, uh, which is an element by element matrix multiplication, uh, which gives you what is known as a feature map. So this is kind of a con convolution operation. And there are multiple layers in a neural net that actually perform this uh, convolution operation starting with the input data and gives out these feature maps. 
Uh, and these layers can be st stacked on top of each other, and this can form the convolutional neural net. And uh, convolutional neural net CNN have uh, clearly basically achieved state-of-the-art performance for especially image and video recognition tasks in, over the past few years. Um, and you'll see why we are choosing this, um, the CNN to actually predict solubility um, in a bit when you realize that the, the smile strings that we use as input can be effectively uh, input as images, 2D, 2D images. So this is just a schematic of, of, a, of a CNN. Uh, I pulled off of Wikipedia, but basically you see we start with an input image and then uh, apply successive convolutions uh, in different multiple layers using one of these kernels or filters, uh, and finally use that use that to uh, predict the property of interest. And uh, I just wanted to mention that you know convolutions for materials have already been uh, applied for a couple of years now. Um, materials can be represented, for example, in smiles. Uh, and here I'm showing you an example of a crystal graph. Uh, this is a work that came out of. Uh, um, Professor Grassman's group at MIT a couple of years ago. And this also follows some kind of uh, approach where the crystal graph is then input into a CNN, which performs all the convolutions and uh, property of interest is predicted. Uh, the second high level concept that I want to cover is auto encoders or auto encoding. This is uh, one of the things we'll be building later. And an auto encoder basically is. A neural network architecture which aims to reconstruct the input data. So sometimes it's also referred to as self supervised learning, where it receives an input and it tries to basically reconstruct that input uh, when it's passed through the neural network. And the basic feature of an autoencoder is that this information that's input is actually squeezed through a bottleneck. That's, a, uh, that's what it's referred to as. Uh, what it means is this this encoder part of the encoder basically involves multiple layers that decrease in size as you go uh, as you go into the neural network with fewer and fewer nodes. So that is a squeezing through the bottleneck, and then we end up with a because of the squeezing through the bottleneck, we end up with a low dimensional latent representation of the input data. And then there's the second half of the auto encoder, which is a decoder network which takes as input this low dimensional latent representation and tries to reconstruct the input as closely as it can. And basically, um, the autoencoder tries to, um, you know, it leads to a lossy compression because of the, the low dimension of the latent representation. Uh, but this, this hopefully has, this latent representation has an important kind of useful uh, representation of the input data. And uh, variational autoencoding is just a variant of that uh, of the autoencoder, where you know in the autoencoder basically this latent representations of the input data are all discrete values, but the auto in, the variational autoencoder on the other hand learns the latent variables as probability distributions. So here again, you know the output from the encoder is instead of discrete values are probability distributions. And these distributions can then be sampled to generate new data, which looks very similar to the input data. So all these different samples are basically um, kind of were not present in the input data, but they are sampled from, from these latent distributions. And thus this kind of uh, continuous, um, this continuous uh, latent probability distributions allows us to, in the, in the case of materials, allows us to sample them to generate new molecules. Right, so I'm just showing you here an example of how it's done. We are going to do something very similar today. Um, you know, use this kind of start with molecules, uh, use a variational autoencoder to generate these continuous latent representations. We're going to sample them, sample these representations, and generate new molecules. So with that, I think we are ready to jump into the notebook. But before that, like Professor Strachan mentioned, I just wanted to mention this. You know, it's uh, just impress upon the participants here that it's, uh, it's not just an academic curiosity. Um, you know, companies are using them. Uh, the, the techniques, the methods that you're going to learn are not very far away from the techniques that um, industrially people are using for materials design and discovery and so on. Um, so Citrine has done a ton of work in this area. If you're interested, you know, subscribe to the newsletter to 
um, to learn about the latest and greatest in the materials informatics um, area. And then you can also visit this, uh, this URL to learn about um, Citrine's materials informatics platform. So with that, I think we are ready to jump into uh, jump into the hands-on part of the workshop. So I hope uh, you can follow me uh, as I walk through the Jupyter notebook. So like I mentioned, the you know the kind of um, outline of this notebook is as follows: We'll first load and pre-process the training data, which is um, a set of solubility data for small organic molecules. We'll build a convolutional neural net to predict the solubility. And then we will also um, train a variational autoencoder that takes SMILES as input and then encodes it. We'll be able to use that to generate new molecules. And to walk through this notebook, actually, if you're not familiar with Jupyter notebooks, uh, these are what you see here are cells, which uh, you know is, you see as um, in these blocks, basically. And if you click on them and you do shift enter, that kind of executes the cell. So when I say please execute this next cell, you can click on the cell and do shift enter. Or you can also alternatively click this button here and say run run cells on whatever cell you are on. You can do run cell and it should it should run. All right, so. So the first cell itself, uh, there's, you know, we are just loading all the libraries that we're going to use through the hands-on workshop. So just uh, go ahead and uh, and execute that. Uh, hopefully, you know, all these libraries should load without any issues. So then let's go ahead and load our data set that we're going to use and interact with the, the data set a little bit to understand how it, how it looks. Um, we're using uh, like I mentioned this ESOL data set from, from the molecule net repo uh, out of Stanford. And so we're using Pandas, another library to actually just read a CSV file and load in this data set. That's all this cell does. So let's go ahead and, uh, and execute this cell as well. And you can, if you go and if you successfully execute that cell, you should be able to see like the, you know, few rows of data from, from the data set. And you can see that you know, we have close to a thousand molecules and we have for each molecule, we have a bunch of different properties. Uh, the ones that we uh, care today uh, are the solubility, which is a log solubility property here, and the smile strings, which basically encode how the molecule um, is represented in this last column. So I'll also, I forgot to zoom in in case people find it hard to see what's on my screen. So um, yeah, let's, let's follow from here. Okay, so now that we've loaded the data set, uh, let us uh, interact with it a little bit to see, just, just to get a feel of what data we are dealing with, right? So this, if you execute the next cell, it's just going to plot a distribution of the various um, of the property we are interested in, which is the log solubility. So we see that it's a, it's a nice, um, nearly normal looking distribution. And then the next, we, we are gonna just look at these, you know, smile strings in the data set and just get a sense of how long these smile strings are, what is, what is the distribution of, of these smile strings. Um, and so let's go ahead and execute the next cell as well. And you should see some plot like this. Uh, and basically, we see that most of our molecules have smile strings, uh, you know, within 60 or so. Uh, and you can see this uh, the distribution here. So we've uh, loaded our data set successfully. We have uh, looked at how, how uh, the molecules are distributed. Uh, so before we start using the smile strings as input to our machine learning models, uh, we need to prepare it to, to actually be able to be read by the machine learning models. And for that, we're going to use something called uh, one-hot encoding, uh, which is a way of converting categorical data into uh, into a vector of zeros and ones. Uh, so, what you know, if you're not familiar with it, I can uh, very quickly go over it. Let's take an example. Um, let's say a pentane, which is you know five carbon atoms. Uh, basically, if in this case with one-hot encoding, we'll be using a vector to represent each character in a smile string of a molecule. So for example, this 
pentane molecule has five C atoms. And for each atom, we are going to uh, have a one hot encoded vector. And the length of that vector is going to be basically uh, all possible smiles characters in the data set, which in this case is 31. So each of these uh, smiles characters is going to be represented by a 31 length vector. Uh, and they're going to have one in the place of C and zero elsewhere. Okay, so if if, if you didn't follow that, uh, don't worry about it. We, we have an example coming up. Uh, so we can take a look at uh, and get a feel for what that looks like. So this this cell basically, uh, you know, generates this one hot encoding for for a given um, smile string for a molecule. So it first uh, gets a set of all unique characters, and here we are defining our maximum smiles characters to be forty, just for simplicity. Uh, and then the smiles to one hot function that you see here is basically a helper utility function that we've written to uh, to convert smiles to one hot. So let's go ahead and execute this cell as well. And so that basically converted all our input data into, into one hot uh, encoding. Okay, so uh, in order to get some more intuition into what that looks like, so we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, execute the next cell as well, uh, which is basically a plot of what our, what our one hot encoding looks like for a given molecule. So if you go ahead and execute the next cell, it is plotting this one hot encoded vector for a single given molecule. And what it's, uh, the molecule here is the COCOC molecule, uh, that is the dimethoxymethane. And you can see that it has um, basically 40, um, 40 vectors. That is what we set our maximum you know, we set the maximum smiles characters length to, and each of those vectors has 31, is of size 31, and 31 is all possible smiles characters that can appear in a smile string. And you can see that in, in, this, in this particular molecule, uh, you know, this 18th character has a one and zeros everywhere else. The next one character has a one at 23 and everywhere else and so on. These correspond to the atom C, atom O, and so on. So you can easily see that this, this corresponds to CO, CO, C, and it basically, everywhere else is zero. Uh, this is actually a padded, um, a padded vector that represents that. So if you want to get some more you know, interactive with it, you can, you can feel free to change this index and, uh, and look at some other molecules. For example, this, this molecule, I don't know what to call it, but you can see uh, how the one hot encoding for that looks like. It's basically a, uh, a matrix with um, with ones and zeros corresponding to what atoms are in the, uh, what characters are in the smile string. So feel free to play around with this and uh, execute the cell just to get a sense of what, what this looks like for different kinds of molecules. Okay, so with that, uh, the one hard encoding now is, uh, is in a state where we can use it directly as input to a machine learning model. So we are ready to build the, the first part of the, um, you know, the neural net exercise, which is building a, a, a convolutional neural net to predict solubility, right? So let us go ahead and do that. So uh, first let us, you know, start by uh, defining the architecture of a neural net model. So we, we first start with the input layer and obviously we want the input to be the one hot encoded smile strings. So that's what this cell defines as. Uh, it defines the shape of the uh, one hot encoded vectors uh, like we see, like we saw in that, um, in that matrix representation previously. So if you go ahead and uh, execute that, that basically defined the first layer. And now since we are building a convolutional neural net, uh, we will define a few convolution layers. And before we start executing this, I want to just highlight a couple of things. Uh, one, like I mentioned earlier, convolution neural nets have shown uh, incredible performance in especially image and video recognition. And you can see that the input to our convolution model is also going to be, even though it's molecules, our one hot uh, encoded representations are basically 2D images uh, with ones and zeros in place of you know, different atoms. So 
convolution neural nets are you know um, a great choice here. They also happen to have some good properties that 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 are very attractive for uh, for materials, which is they have some translational invariance, rotational invariance, and so on. So which is uh, which is really what we want in when we are modeling molecules. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, add a few convolutional layers to our network. Uh, there are a couple of you know a few hyperparameters or uh, hyperparameters are basically uh, secondary parameters which govern the um, kind of the architecture of the neural network, how to optimize it, how to train it, and so on, uh, which we won't go into detail today. Uh, but these number of convolutional filters, the kernel size, uh, and these are all kind of hyperparameters that in an actual application you would need to actually tune um, and change and see how the how the neural net changes, how the neural net performs, uh, and come to an optimum uh, value. But today we're just going to use fixed numbers here. You can feel free to change these numbers um, and play around with with how these uh, how that changes the the outcome of these uh, of the model that we're going to build. So in this case, we're you know we're adding four convolution layers, and like I said, this four number is also just a choice for uh, as an example uh, for today's workshop. So let's go ahead and execute the next cell. So this basically defined four convolution layers. The first one takes as input uh, the one hot encoded mm, smile strings. The second one takes as input the output from the first layer, and so on. Right. So we're going to join these layers in a bit when all this kind of hopefully becomes a lot clearer. Um, but yeah, these, we just defined the four layers, and then. Uh, let's go ahead and finally, after these convolution layers, define a final kind of dense uh, hidden layer that takes as input the output from these convolution layers and outputs the property that we want, which is the, the solubility of the molecule. So we have this final kind of a hidden layer uh, and, and uh, you know, the output layer, which is basically the, uh, the log solubility that we are looking for. So if you go ahead and execute the cell as well, that defines all the layers we want. Now we are ready to actually arrange the layers in, in, in ways that make sense to build our complete neural network. So let's go ahead and do that. So this next, uh, if you look at the next cell, you see how the, the entire neural network is, is built together. Um, you know, the first convolution uh, layer gets as input smiles and out, outputs into the second convolution layer and so on. And the final convolution layer outputs into the final kind of dense layer, and then that outputs the solubility, right? So the, we'll also visualize this kind of neural network architecture in a bit, but let's go ahead and execute this. So we now connected neural, neural net and the whole net is ready for us to uh, train and use to make predictions. Uh, but before that, we can actually go ahead and uh, visualize the the model that we're going to build. Um, so with this neural net, let's also you know define what what exactly we want to do, right? So even though the neural net is is defined, the model we want to build is basically uh, like we discussed. The input should be smiles, the output should be solubility, uh, and this compiling basically um, you know specifies the way in which these neural networks are trained. Um, in terms of how the, the weights and the parameters that go into each of the individual neurons, how they're updated, uh, that is defined by this optimizer function. Uh, you don't need to worry about it. These are all kind of, uh, Adam is one kind of a, a stochastic gradient descent optimizer. Uh, the, it's a safe choice for most of these applications. Uh, the loss function is basically what defines how the, new, how the neural net uh, parameters get updated. So this, this loss function is the mean square error loss here, which means that the neural net keeps updating parameters uh, in such a way so as to reduce this uh, mean square error between the output solubility and the actual true solubility. Right? We'll see that in a bit. Um, and then the, there are some metrics we can care, you know, we can uh, we can basically monitor this a mean absolute error and so on. So let's go ahead and execute this cell as well. And before we run and train our network, let us finally visualize the whole uh, neural net and see how it looks. Right. So this Keras to ASCII is a, is just a nifty um, ASCII module that 
that outputs these you know uh, structural network. So this should kind of hopefully make sense in you know from what we described earlier. We start with the input layer and its dimensions is uh, what belongs to uh, uh, the smiles input, the one hot encoded smile strings, forty times thirty one, and then we have a bunch of convolutional layers that we defined. Uh, and if you you know if you don't understand why the size decreases, that's fine. That's just a um, byproduct of applying convolutions. And then finally, we are flattening this uh, convolutional output and predicting the solubility. Right. So this is the this is the entire convolution neural So this looks good. Let's let's go ahead and and train our model. So the next cell does exactly that. This fit function, basically, you specify what data to use to train the neural net. Uh, and epochs is basically how many training cycles, how many times you uh, go forward through the neural net and backward to actually up. That is what is epochs. Batch size is basically how many rows to compute at once. And these are all kind of again hyperparameters that you may need to tune uh, for your, for a real application. You can actually change it in in um, in today's workshop and see how how the output changes. Uh, but for now, I, I think I'll just execute the cell as is. And this validation data basically specifies a holdout set. Uh, so the neural net is being trained on this on on a subset of the entire data set. And this validation set is a subset of the data set which is held out on which the neural net is, uh, performance is tested. Um, so that is kind of a way to see if a neural net is underfit or overfit and so on. Uh, we'll plot the performance in a bit when it becomes uh, a lot clearer. Uh, basically, I went and executed that cell. And you can see that um, the training epochs have begun. Uh, for each epoch, you can see things like the metrics that we were following, which is mean absolute error, the validation loss, mean absolute uh, validation mean absolute error, and so on, um, the loss. And as you can see, with each epoch, each training cycle, the errors are all kind of um, going down, which is what we want. All right. So let's go ahead, uh, now that all the training cycles are done, uh, let's go ahead and plot uh, some of these, um, how the performance of the neural net looks like, uh, how the loss looks like, right? So with, and I'm plotting here the uh, the loss or error or difference between the prediction and the true value um, as a function of training cycle or epoch. And as you can see, both the training error and the validation error are decreasing, uh, that is good. Um, you may see in some cases the validation error increasing after a few epochs, whereas the training error keeps going down. That is like a classic uh, case of overfitting, in which case you'll have to tweak some hyperparameters to uh, regularize your neural net. Anyway, this, this model looks good, so we can go ahead and use it to make predictions. Okay, so now that we have a trained model, we just need to put it one heart uh, representation of smile strings. So for example, I just have three examples here uh, for which we are going to convert these smile strings into uh, one heart encodings using this function and just feed it into the model that we just trained. So this, this function here basically receives an input, these example smiles, and should output the solubility uh, from the neural net. So if you go ahead and execute that cell, you see that for these three examples, we actually have predicted uh, log solubilities. You can feel free to change uh, some of the code here, add, add new molecules. Um, I'm just going to create something, write something random. Uh, I hope these are all um, legitimate smiles characters, but you can, you can, you know, change the, um, change the molecules here, add new ones, et cetera, and see how, um, see how the predictions turn out. So these look okay. Let's take a look at the entire data set and see how the how the neural net performs. Uh, so we, for that, we just you know look at the entire training set and ask the neural net to predict the solubility for everything, and then we can compare as a whole for the whole data set uh, how the predictions and and the true values look like. So that's what the next cell is doing. Uh, it's basically a parity plot, predictions versus ground truth, uh, 
Um, and you can see that it performs reasonably well. You know, this uh, diagonal orange line is uh, the true value and it's uh, it's nearly along with that. So uh, that, was, that was good for, you know, a very basic, uh, without tuning any hyperparameters model, uh, we built a CNN that actually predicts uh, solubility of any given molecule. Um, and Keras uh, has some nice interfaces uh, to actually save the model once you train it. Um, you know, so sometimes when you're building large models, it may take a long time to train models. You don't want to do that again and again. You can save it, and every time you have a new molecule you want to uh, make predictions on, you just load it back and um, and feed it the new molecule, and it will give you a, your predicted solubility. So let's uh, let's go ahead and test that. So you know, if you run that cell, it, you can see that it just saves saves the model, and you're able to load the mo uh, load the saved model back into the into the notebook. Okay, that's uh, that's a CNN for predicting um, solubility. Uh, so the second half is kind of building this variational autoencoder to to generate novel molecules, right? Um, so let's kind of uh, run through this as well. Um, so the first step, you know, uh, like I showed in, in the slides, uh, is to actually build the encoder block of the neural network that, that takes as inputs size um, one hard encoded representations and converts it into a Latin representation. And the second half is a decoder network, which takes as input these latent representations and output smiles molecules. So that's what we're going to try to do now. Uh, we can all, you know, we can use uh, new layers for this model or reuse the ones that we defined earlier for the convolutional neural net. Uh, we will do exactly that. We will actually reuse most of the layers that we defined earlier. Um, and you can, you will see this later when we start joining the network together. Uh, but for now, this is just one, you know, one hidden layer that we're going to define. So go ahead and um, execute that cell. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, this variational autoencoder actually learns these latent representations as probability distributions. And we are going to later sample these probability distributions to, act, to generate new molecules. So for that, let us, uh, we need to define some functions that we're going to do later. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into details of this. This is something referred to as the reparameterization re trick. Um, you know, you, you can uh, go ahead and look at some of the links posted in this notebook to get some more details. Uh, but this this function basically helps us sample from the Latin uh, representation, uh, which we'll use to actually generate uh, new molecules. Um, and then there is there are some other layers here, which don't really, which are not really layers in the sense that they don't really um, do any um, forward propagation or um, or convolutions. They just um, layers in, in, in the neural network that basically capture the, the mean of the distribution, the variance of the distribution of these latent variables. Uh, so we are going to define all that to, to use later. So let's go ahead and execute that cell. So like I said, for the encoder bit, we are going to reuse most of the CNN uh, part of the network that we defined earlier. We still need to define and uh, construct the decoder part of the, auto, uh, of the VAE. And for the decoder part, we are going to use uh, what is known as a recurrent neural network. And there's only, if, you know, as an example, uh, we just wanted to show you an example of using a recurrent neural network. Uh, there's no real reason for us to be using RNN. Uh, we could be using a CNN as well for the decoder. So if you look at some of the examples on, on the Keras or TensorFlow website, you can actually see uh, both the encoder and decoder modules uh, comprising CNNs and not RNNs. In this case, it, it, you know, just to give an example of how the RNN works, uh, we're using we're going to use that. So RNN is basically a type of another type of neural network that, in addition to um, just using the inputs that uh, that go into a regular neural network, can take into account the history of the network. It can take into account some temporal information. So that's why it's a it's a very powerful tool in things like natural language processing speech to text translation and um, you know modeling time series data and so on. And the particular type of RNN we're going to use here are called uh, GRUs or gated recurrent units. Uh, again, I, won't, I don't want to go into details here, uh, 
Um, but you can follow up some, you know, with this link here and learn how they, they work. Uh, but if you're familiar with LSTMs or heard of LSTMs, they are very sim similar, uh, slightly simpler uh, versions of LSTMs. Uh, so we're going to define the decoder part of the network here. Uh, and for that, the first thing we want to do is make sure that the output from the decoder is actually the same length as, as the input, which is the maximum smiles characters. We're just going to you know, uh, men, uh, do that here. And it defined basically three recurrent neural network layers. The, the, the GRU units that you see here, uh, we define three layers. Uh, again, these the three number here is kind of arbitrary. This is something that this is a hyperparameter you, you may need to tune in your actual application. Uh, you can also try, you know, um, commenting out one of these layers and, and see see how the output changes. You can add an additional layer and so on and play around with this notebook. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that cell. So that defined um, the need a final uh, RNN layer that's going to take as input um, this final uh, output from the RNA decoder and actually output the smile strings that we care about. So that's what this cell is, is actually initializing. So it, it, this, this cell outputs the smile strings that we, can, uh, that we can actually make sense of. So go ahead and execute that cell. Um, now that we have all the layers, we can again do something similar to what we did in the CNN case and connect them all together to form uh, our complete neural net. Uh, so if you look at this cell, the following cell, I hope this kind of a connection rings a bell from the CNN part of the notebook. Uh, at least the first half is exactly the same as we as we what we used in the CNN. So it starts with the smiles input as, a, as the first input layer, and then passes through a bunch of convolution layers, and finally predicts the uh, predicts the solubility here. It's it's just the final flattened layer, which which basically is is the you know the squeezing through the bottleneck that we talked about, and this is the the latent representation is captured in basically the mean the the log variance of the distributions, and the and finally these are new layers that we created the decoder layers which take as input these latent representations and reconstruct the smile strings for us. Uh, so the final output here is going to be the smile strings that, that we can actually convert back into molecules. Right? So I hope this kind of uh, construction makes sense. Let's go ahead and execute that cell as well. Uh, so now we have the complete neural network in place. Um, a couple of things we still need to do. Similar to the CNN case, we need to actually uh, define our model. In this case, it's going to be you know, inputs are smiles inputs. And outputs are also smiles and outputs. Uh, so that's basically what the uh, VAE does, right? It tries to reconstruct the, reconstruct the input. And then um, before we start training the, the neural net, we need to define what our loss is. And in this case, we're going to um, previously we used the mean square error as a loss, right? So here we're going to change it a little bit. Uh, we're going to define what is called as a reconstruction loss, which is how close the final output is to is when compared to the to the input we want them to be as close as possible so we want this reconstruction loss to be low and then the second term here which is a KL loss uh, which basically tells the neural net to match the probability distributions uh, as closely as possible to the to the input one so it's kind of you know this is um, what we refer to here as VAE loss and that's the one that we're going to use to actually train our network so go ahead and execute the cell. Uh, this should actually uh, have us uh, ready to go. Before we train the VAE, let's just uh, you know look at the model graph. And hopefully, this this uh, architecture is kind of reminds you of the first CNN we built up to up till here is basically the same as the first uh, neural net we built. And then the, these dense layers are squeezing through the bottleneck for the VAE. Uh, and then all the decoder network that we built that takes as input latent uh, representation and outputs the final smile strings. Right. So now it's time to train our VAE. So basically, this this next cell is going to do that. It's just going to 
uh, reset all the all the decoder states to zero, and then uh, similar to the CNN case, it, it you know we specify the number of training cycles and validation data and so on, uh, some other hyperparameters, and let's go ahead and execute that cell. Um, it's going to take a minute to complete. Basically, you should um, you should start seeing some output about the um, training cycles happening. Which somehow I am not able to see. So okay, so I I don't think I'll I'll wait because we're running out of time. So basically, if you run this cell, you should be able to see a list of you know epochs and similar to what we saw earlier, um, a list of uh, VAE loss, um, validation loss, and so on. And after twenty epochs, you should be able to see a completely. Maybe I can try. Interrupting it. So you can see that it started training now. It's going to take a minute, but you should be able to see some output like this. Uh, for each epoch, it's going to run through this uh, neural net. Uh, do some back, back propagation, update the weights, and so on. Uh, this is actually running really slowly, so I'm, going, I'm not going to wait. So once this uh, this kind of training is complete, um, we can take a look at how the model is performing. Uh, again, we're plotting um, the error in training and validation in the next cell. So you can go ahead and uh, if your training is complete, you can go ahead and execute that cell. If your training is still running, then you know once it's once it's done, you'll be able to see um, similar to what we saw earlier. The training and validation loss is actually decreasing as a function of epochs. Yeah, this is running really slowly, so I'm going to just skip this uh, this section. And uh, the last the last thing we want to do is basically use the decoder part of the uh, graph that we used. Uh, and which receives as input the Latin representation and outputs the, the smiles uh, notation. So uh, I won't be able to show, show that live now uh, as my neural net is still training. Maybe I can change this epoch to you. I think the fact that it's slow, it's a good sign. It means that a lot of people are actually able to run this. So we have right. 120 participants all running training neural networks. So that, that puts our, our nano half computers in a little bit of strain. Right. So right. just just be a, uh, let's just be a little patient. Yeah, I mean that does make sense. Even though I changed this epoch to two, I guess you can you guys can whoever you know when you're running your notebooks, uh, you can change to whatever you want. Uh, this is not going to be a great model uh, because I'm training it only twice, but uh, just for the sake of demonstration, I think it's going to be OK. So we're running close to time here. So I'm going to just uh, you know run through the final couple of cells as soon as this training is done. Um, so basically, we are plotting the error as a function of the training cycles. And then we're using the decoder part of the graph that we that we defined earlier, the decoder part of the VAE, uh, and feed it basically um, sampling from the latent variable distribution, and see that it outputs smile strings. So, uh, you know, I just uh, described what the what the two cells do. So I'm going to run through these cells. Okay, so please execute these cells as in when your um, training is done. You can see that. The training error is going down. I mean, the, you know, th this plot will look better when you actually do more than a few, a few training cycles. But I'll just go ahead and use it anyway. So, like I said, this is just a decoder part of the model, uh, which takes as input the decoder input and outputs the smile strings. And we can also visualize this decoder part, and you should. This should make sense, right? This is this is what we defined in the VAE, but this is only the decoder part. The encoder part is, is missing. So with this in in tow, let's actually go ahead and execute this last cell. 
which should actually uh, generate some smile strings for us. So you can see some of the smile strings that it generates. It's all these, you know, alkanes. There's some uh, oxygen. It's, it's basically valid um, smile strings. Uh, and some of these weird looking smile strings are because we used a really small training set and basically my, my VAE was not trained. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of an example of how we can use VAE to actually generate these novel molecules, which are not, you know, these are completely designed from scratch. These are not in our training set. And finally, like the CNN case, there are also API things to load our modules and, you know, save them and so on. Uh, but I hope this kind of has given you a feel for uh, the two applications, building CNNs to predict some property of interest, building VAEs to actually learn some latent representations of our, of our material to actually uh, generate new materials from scratch. Uh, so with that, I will stop here. Uh, I want to thank Professor Staka and Saket for organizing this, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, so I, I'd like to thank you, um, uh, Vinay, for, for a great seminar. I um, think everyone uh, had an uh, excellent um, uh, response to, to the notebook. Um, in the interest of time, let me uh, ask one question that summarizes a bunch of questions that we got in the Q&A. And it's how do you go about optimizing hyperparameters? What are the, the techniques to do that? Right. So there are there are a lot of lot of different techniques to do that. There are actually some packages which uh, kind of do it for you. They you know there is there are auto ML packages which which have basically even um, kind of automated the whole process of fitting hyperparameters. But kind of a naive way to do it would be to set aside a validation set of data and then do kind of a grid search over all the hyperparameters that you care about. Uh, this is kind of a slow process, uh, and you know people have come up with better techniques. Uh, some a recent work has shown that even random sampling of all the hyperparameters actually is very efficient in finding, finding good hyperparameters um, if you randomly sample from uh, a space of all possible hyperparameters and test it on a validating validation set, um, the performance of the neural nets that you're building and tweak the hyperparameters suitably, then this, this is actually still a good method. Uh, but like I said, there's already libraries which, which do this for you. So you don't need to actually um, do this by hand in most of cases. Right. And certainly at the beginning, if you're learning about this, doing it by hand is not a bad idea. So you develop yeah. a little bit of an intuitive understanding of what's going on, even yeah. though it's, it's uh, very time consuming. So, Definitely. And, uh, and just, I just want to add the general kind of advice is, you know, start simple and build complex. You know, you, you start very simple and add, add new hyperparameters, add new layers and so on and so forth. Uh, that kinds of builds the intuition as you go. So, uh, that's a good strategy to have always. So uh, thanks, uh, Vinay, again. And uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. Uh, thanks so much.